Welcome to another episode of Conversations. Today we have Mary Beth O'Connor. Welcome, Mary Beth. I'm happy to have you here. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yes. Okay. So Mary Beth wrote a book. It's a memoir, correct? Correct. Junkie to Judge, One Woman's Triumph Over Trauma and Addiction. So clearly everyone knows what we're talking about today. Uh, so did you always want to be a writer? Was that it, always in the back pocket? It was really, I mean, I did like to write when I was younger, but I really always intended to go to law school. It just got very, very delayed because of my drug addiction. So I actually ended up going to law school at 39 years old. Wow. And so, so it was a career change, but that was only six years into my sobriety because I was using until I was 32. So I, mm -hmm. I'm legal writing. I'm good at it, but it's a very different than memoir writing, which is more like writing a novel. So it was an interesting challenge to figure out how to write a good memoir. It, does a memoir, is that like a diary? Is it, does it read like that? It should read like a novel. It should be immersive, in scene, engaging, capture the reader's attention and emotion. But also memoir usually has what's called reflection, where the author will talk about what the event meant at the time or how they view it later. So it's like a it's like a novel plus. <laughs> OK, OK. Well, I know that you got into your I've seen other videos of yours where you say that you got into your drug habit because of trauma that had happened as a child and whether you want to get into that or not, I just wondered what was it that, where did you start? Where did you start drinking as a child or what happened? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the subtitle is, you know, um, uh, it mentions the trauma and addiction because there's a very close correlation. Kids who have trauma in their childhoods and or mental health conditions. Uh, and for me, it was anxiety and PTSD, although I didn't know it. Their odds of developing a substance use disorder are a lot higher. And so my first drug was alcohol. It was when I was 12 and it was Boone's Farms Strawberry Hill <laughs> Wine, which a lot of people know, you know. It's very economic. Yes, economical, <laughs> very sweet, right? An introductory, easy, sweet drug. Um, and so, yeah, we actually were so young, we drank it out of Flintstones glasses that used to have grape jelly in it. I mean, that's, that was our level of those. sophistication, yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, well, there is a big gap between that and meth in my mind. How in the world did that start? Yeah. So, I mean, I pursued alcohol right away, like pursued it because it made me feel better. I mean, in the, in the beginning, it seems to help. It, it made me more relaxed. I wasn't as stressed because I, you know, was always living under so much fear and really rage and pain. Um, but I quickly added in weed. I did pills. I did a lot of acid my sophomore year of high school. And I found meth early. I was 16 when I started using methamphetamine and I was shooting that up meth by 17. I was in full bore addiction in high school. So it is a, a trajectory, you know, into a harsh drug. Although in the long run, alcohol is vicious too. It just yeah. takes longer for the negative impacts to really show up for most people. Um, but it was, it was a progression as a sort of a pain management tool, which is why a lot of people turn to excess use of drugs. Right. Well, how does a 12 year old get <laughs> Boone's farm? How, how are you able to get all this alcohol at 12 and 13 years old? I mean, yeah, I know. It's funny because people always talk, think like drugs are hard to get. But I mean, even today, if your child wants alcohol, if your child wants weed, I mean, the truth is that drugs are usually readily available to people. Yeah. And they certainly were in my day. And I would even I would even steal alcohol from my very violent stepfather. Like, that's how much I wanted it. I was willing to take risks. Um, but also I was tall for my age. I looked older. I ha hung out with a bit of an older crowd, which made it a little bit easier, too. Yeah. So did your, were your parents aware or were you um, in trouble in school and stuff? Were you skipping school? So, I mean, for me in my crazy, you know, violent childhood, school was like my one positive experience. I, I, I always got a lot of po ex extra attention, positive attention, because I did really well. And so that was sort of the one place where I felt special and where I sort of wow. felt seen. Um, and so when I was using drugs, I generally, school was, you know, relatively easy for me. I was able to keep up until my senior year when I was starting to really use meth heavily. And then I started missing school a lot. But 
it was really towards the second half of my senior year. And, you know, for college, they don't really see your grades, you know, in the second half of your senior year. Mm -hmm. So I had already been accepted to college by that time, and it didn't have sort of a big impact on me. Were you ever closeted as, I mean, or did everybody that you hung up out with, they all did drugs too in college and high school and everything? I mean, in high school, it was a split because I was in the academically advanced classes where many fewer of the people used and certainly right. they didn't use drugs on a regular basis the way that I did. But even so, my outside of school friends were mostly druggy friends over time, increasingly <laughs> druggy friends. But even in the druggy group, I was considered extreme. I mean, other people that were using drugs were telling me to slow down by the time I was like 15 years old. And so I was really on the outer edge. Yes. What was the turning point then? Because you clearly kept going strong with it. So what what stopped it from continuing? Yeah, I mean, I did a little better in college for the first couple of years, but then I had this really life-threatening rape by three men for six hours. I moved in with a violent boyfriend and I sort of lost the little bit of grip that I got back. And I used again on a really almost daily basis from co uh, senior year of college to 32. So it was a really long haul for me. Um, but by 32, I was having some physical problems. I mean, meth is a very toxic drug. It was showing up uh, in my body. I also was just, you know, emotionally devastated, feeling so trapped, so hopeless. I, I couldn't hold a job. Um, right. And then my partner was ready to throw me out. So it was sort of like everything in combination that at 32 made me say, you know, maybe I ought to go to rehab. <laughs> <laughs> now is the time. So you did it like cold turkey? You know, I mean, I, I went into an inpatient program. It was a longer term, you know, 90 day minimum, but I used three times in my first five months. And that is very common. Perfect abstinence happens, but it's rare. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't, you, you don't know how to do it for one thing. You sort of don't have the skills to, to right. stay abstinent, but also, you know, your brain is sort of still stuck in that pattern. And so three times in five months, you know, was vast, a vast, vast improvement. Right. Um, and then I had, um, I had just had 30 years of continuous sobriety in January. So yeah. Congratulations. That is so awesome. That's probably even hard to grasp that you've been sober almost as long. Well, you a long time. <laughs> I'm not going to do the math. <laughs> you, you've been sober for a long time and that's just amazing. You probably feel like that happened to somebody else. It probably feels like a, a movie you saw or something. Well, it's interesting because I, I think part of, you, you know, the reason I've never really been, I've never really struggled after the first two and a half years. And one of the things I do emphasize that going from 29 years to 30 years of sobriety, that is not the hard part. Okay. That's not the hard part. Um, for me, it was, you know, I did a really intensive focus on building a strong, you know, recovery program and carrying it out in my first two and a half years. But for me, that also involved a mental health treatment. Like I knew that that these trauma was underneath my drug use. And so when I got home from rehab, I started working with a therapist who had a little bit of addiction expertise, but a lot of trauma expertise. And so she correctly, but to my surprise, diagnosed me with PTSD. And for me, it showed up as severe anxiety. And so today we call that co-occurring disorders or dual diagnosis. Diagnosis. And about 55 to 70 percent of people that have a substance use disorder also have one or more other mental health conditions. I mean, wow. substance use disorder is a mental health condition, but they also have others. And so it's important to address both. Um, I knew that to really be able to be happy, to sort of connect to my true self, to build a productive life, I had to address both. But the other side of it is that it can be really hard to stay sober if your mental health isn't under good control. And it can be really hard to get your mental health under control if you're not able to get to sobriety when you have an addiction. Right. And so they sort of go hand in hand. Correct me if I'm wrong, but when people are suffering from PTSD or anxiety, severe, aren't drugs something that are prescribed a lot of the time? Well, I mean, there's a difference between what's called self-medicating, where people are using drugs to try to reduce their symptoms. Yes. A lot of times that's why people turn to drug use yes. in their teenage years, but um, it's better to have the right drug <laughs> in the right dose. Yeah, right. Amount. Now, it is true that sometimes, for example, 
um, things that we think of as, you know, as substances of abuse might be prescribed, like ADHD medication is a type of amphetamine, but yeah. it's in a controlled dose under supervision, which is very different than, you know, getting it off the street and staying up for a week. So yeah. it's the whole right. different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess um, what I was wondering was just, is it smart to reintroduce something that could become like how painkillers are for people. You know what I mean? How they can get addicted to those. I just didn't know if that was still a means of how people can correct their issues. Yeah. So there's a couple of things about that. One is there's um, there's a, today a distinction between dependence and addiction. And so someone, let's oh. say somebody has a you know bad back and they're on opiates under you know prescribed opiates and they're taking them as prescribed long term. They might develop a physical dependence in the sense that you would have a withdrawal if you stop. So you'd have to do that under supervision. But addiction is different. Addiction, or which we call today substance use disorder, is defined as continuing to use despite negative consequences. So it's not really about what you're consuming. It's about how is it impacting your life. The other side of that is that like 80% of the people in general who used substances, including alcohol, never develop a problem. So the focus is on when you keep using, even though it's hurting you in, in, you know, in these ways, it's impacting your ability to hold a job, it's impacting your relationships, your health, or things that you just want to do. That's the current definition of substance use disorder. Okay. Well, you look great. <laughs> So I'm sitting here thinking like, are you okay now when you go and get physicals? Have you recovered? Have you managed to recover? Yeah. So, I mean, I was lucky that when I got sober, I didn't have um, HIV or hepatitis C or any of the blood borne diseases that you can get from sharing needles because of HIV. I live near San Francisco viewed HIV as the bigger risk. And so they started doing syringe services. So I haven't had any long-term medical consequences from my drug use. Um, but part of that is because I used harm reduction by using the needle exchange. Right. So now, well, not now because you're retired, but you went from one area completely to the other. You became a judge. Explain, <laughs> Explain yeah. how this happened. Well, I will say when I got sober, now remember I had this, I had a Berkeley degree. I actually had good grades, but I had an embarrassing resume. And so when I got sober, my I wasn't thinking one day I'll be a judge or even a lawyer. I was thinking, let's not get fired again. Like, that was my <laughs> professional goal. Okay? Shoot for the stars. <laughs> and the truth is when I got home from rehab, I actually wasn't even ready for a full-time, much less professional job. So I started um, my first job sober was a low level administrative job that was temporary and part time because it's really all I was ready to handle. And then I worked my way up. My second job was a full time permanent mid level administrative job. And then I got a supervisory job at a bigger company. I got a promotion. And at six and a half years sober, I went to Berkeley Law. I worked at a big law firm. Then I did class action work for the federal government. And I emphasize at 20 years sober, I was appointed a federal administrative law judge. So it wasn't like I ever saw that in my future. It yeah. was, When I got sober, it was really about what job can I handle now? Now, what's the sort of the right next step? How do I get myself ready for the right next step? And when I get that job, what's the right next step? And so when I talk to newcomers in particular, I really emphasize that incremental progression for not just professionally, but in all areas of my life. For me, it was really about that. It's like it, 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 I found it most useful to prioritize what I could actually handle working on, because when I got sober, I had a lot to fix, but I couldn't possibly do it all at once. But then I set my you know initial goal, my initial plan carried out. OK, next step, next step. And it's really amazing how far you can go, even in three or five years by doing that approach, much less in 20 or 30 years. I mean, the your life is really open to so many possibilities if you can just move forward incrementally, step by step. Being patient with the process. Yes. yes. And that's yeah, hard yes. for all of us. I For sure, for me, it is. I am not a patient person. We all want instant. You know, yes. we're a microwave society. We all want that three minutes or less. <laughs> well, the other sign of that is that when you get sober, you are hyper aware you've lost all this time, right? Oh, I mean, I was sure. 32 and I had, you know, wasted my degree, wasted my education, lost another 10 years of my life. So there is that um, sort of emotional 
urge to push forward, but sometimes it's really better to stop and get develop a realistic plan. Sometimes if you try to race ahead too fast, you actually will end up losing more ground rather than, you know, being realistic about what you can handle. Right. Well, I'm glad you ma- were able to maintain your brain your mind, yeah. you know, that you could yeah. do something like this. That's huge. I, you just seem so fresh and alive and it's wonderful to see because you don't picture that when you think of somebody that was an addict, you think that they are never going to bounce back like that. That's right. And part of the reason I do really want to own the IV meth side of it, years of IV meth use is to help, first of all, reduce the stigma of, you know, injection drug use, which is Morse is the most stigmatized of the drug use methods, um, whereas, you know, addiction in general is stigmatized, but you yeah. use, throw needles into the mix and it's worse. So I wanted to publicly own that, but also as a reassurance to the person still struggling or their friends or family. I mean, I didn't get sober till 32 either. It's not like I used mm-hmm. for a year. And so part of it is to just sort of be an example of what recovery can look like and, you know, that there's still, um, there's still time to, to get out of it and find a way forward. And sometimes that means we need to help you get out of it and find a way forward. Right. So do you go and talk to schools? Do you go to uh, open door missions? Where do you advocate? Yeah, I mean, I talked in a lot of different air, you know, uh, to a lot of different audiences. I have talked to schools uh, a bit, and I'm certainly open to doing more of that. I talk to parent, you know, friends and family sometimes. Mm-hmm. I talk to different organizations, uh, like I've, you know, conferences, and I do. I've created workshops. I talk to different groups. I do keynotes like for fundraisers to help, you know, recovery mm-hmm. organizations raise money. I'm on the board for Life Ring Secular Recovery and I'm on the board for She Recovers Foundation. And then I, I do write not just my book, but I've had opinion pieces in the Wall Street Journal and the LA Times and others. So I do try to, you know, use use um, my my retirement life um, to try to help sh- educate and reduce stigma and, sh- you know, really share hope. That's wonderful, especially since you're retired. You know, a lot of people would just want to go sit on a beach somewhere. (laughs) It's about my first three years. And so I really wanted to show sort of a realistic example of what recovery looks like, because so many memoirs at the end, they're like, I went to a couple of meetings and everything was great. And it's like, well, that's not how recovery works. Um, and I definitely see writing more pieces like, you know, for publication, smaller pieces, another book we'll see, I'd be surprised. Um, but you know, never say never, right. Never yeah. say I could have, a, I could have a great idea tomorrow and decide I want to pursue it. That's true. So uh, you probably say in your book, but did you grow up with siblings? Did they also get into drug addiction? Yeah. My sister, who was just two years younger than me, also had a long-term problem as well. And again, she grew up in that same, you know, household, right? And so she was at the same uh, increased risk that I was. And so, yes, it's we are really the first two in my family to have substance addictions, but gambling problems run in my family as well. Other people have had struggles with that. Um, But she and I were the first chemical, uh, the first chemical addictions in the family. How is she? She's doing well now. I mean, she got, uh, she was, her process was a little later in her life than mine, but she's, you know, doing really well. She's got a regular job. She's, uh, you know, sober. And so it's, um, it's been a, a joy to see that. I mean, there were times where I didn't hear from her for like 18 months and didn't know what was going on. So mm-hmm. When I talk to friends and family, one of the things I emphasize is that everybody I know with an addiction, we are friends and family too, right? We we have friends and family that struggle. Even when we're sober, we have those same fears. And so I have been through that side of it as well. Um, and so I do understand the sort of the frustration, the fears that the friends and family go through. Yeah. Well, I think it's amazing that you've taken a negative and turned it into a positive because that's very difficult to do and you've turned it around. I think you should do a podcast like you should have one. I thought about it and maybe in the future we'll we'll see how I mean it's about having enough time but um but I have thought about it and now I have a lot of, you know, good connections and could bring a lot of interesting guests. Yes. So we'll see. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, that's that's a definite maybe a definite maybe <laughs> yeah because I think a lot of the times what people don't realize is that people kind of closet listening to things certain topics like 
you know, podcasts that might talk about addiction because they want to listen about a friend that has it or, and it's their way of doing it in secret and in private, <laughs> but learning, you know, educating themselves without having to go to a meeting or announce it to everyone that they're going to, you know, pursue knowledge in that area. Yeah, you're right. And the truth is, I do really, I read about an hour a day about like, there are a lot of new studies that come out about um, addiction and recovery. There are a lot of articles and opinion pieces. And I try to really keep up with what's going mm -hmm. on, the new science, so that I can talk from an intelligent or a, a well-informed um base when I'm asked questions. Right. And so I, I can really see bringing not just personal stories in, but also people to talk about the different science aspects of um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, Mary Beth, it's been just such a pleasure to talk to you. Can you tell everybody where they can find you if they want to read any of your articles or find your book? Sure. So my website is junkietojudge.com. My a lot of my opinion pieces are there. Some of my um uh, podcast television interviews are there and uh you can also message me through there. So if oh, you ever okay. have an opportunity for me to speak or a question, feel free to message me. My memoir, From Junkie to Judge, One Woman's Triumph Over Trauma and Addiction, is on Amazon and all the usual sites, and your bookstore has it or can get it. And then I am on X, you know, slash Twitter, and I will say, I don't argue with people on X, but what I do <laughs> is... I post um, links to those articles and, and um, uh, the new data that comes out and my recovery thoughts, and I'm at Mary Beth O underscore, and I'm also on LinkedIn. Awesome. I'll definitely look you up on both of those. I want to check it out. But thank you so much, Mary Beth. I, you've just been a delight. And I'm so happy for you. Congratulations on 30 years of sobriety and for being a role model for people that may feel lost right now. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the conversation. It was fun. All right. Thank you so much. Take care. We'll be in touch. Bye-bye.